Welcome to the Story Geeks show. Let me bring up my notes here. I just I just put my notes behind the window like a total pro. <laughs> Robert Eggers was inspired by the same story that inspired Shakespeare when he wrote Hamlet. Welcome to the Story Geek Show. On today's show, we'll be digging deeper into the storytelling driving the Northmen, one of the best films of 2022 thus far, at least in my opinion, but we will get into that more. We will start out with a brief review of the Northmen and then give a spoiler warning before we get into the details. I'm Jay Shear, co-writer of Death of a Bounty Hunter and Time Slingers. The full cast audiobook of Death of a Bounty Hunter is now available via our website on audiobooks.com, and on Apple Books. Support this show by purchasing a copy. Links are down in the description below. Joining me on today's show, I think a huge Robert Eggers fan, honestly, Mr. Josh Taylor. I am, in fact, a huge <laughs> Robert Eggers fan. That is true. That's why That's why I wanted to have you on the show, partially, too, because I know that you've been a big fan of his. You've seen everything that he's done, essentially, all, all his features, at least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, between the stuff that he's directed and written, I'm pretty sure I've seen everything he's done. Uh, I mean, it's not like a huge, giant list. You know, no, he's like, done three. I mean, he's done three. <laughs> That's about it, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think that he was also um, a part of a couple of like other films, like as far as being like a production designer. Oh, yes, yes, something. yes, yes. But like otherwise, yeah, I mean, this isn't like Steven Spielberg where we're talking about like decades of yeah. work. <laughs> we're right. talking about like... Three films, The Witch, The Lighthouse, and The Northman. Exactly. A lot and of does. by the way, some of his short films sound like amazing to see from Robert Eggers. So like he did a he has a he says it's pretty weird, but he has a telltale heart um Edgar Allan Poe short. And I'm like, dude, that sounds like who better to do that than Robert Eggers? It's true. Yeah. How are you this morning, Josh Taylor? Dude, I am so good. I'm sitting here with my coffee. Uh, just hanging out <laughs> perfect, and enjoying the day. That's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. Um, by the way, you can follow Josh at Modern Mouse Josh on Twitter. So go check out his stuff. He is back into the podcasting arena and releasing shows and doing YouTubes. So check that out. Uh, Modern Mouse on the YouTube channel, Modern Mouse on the podcast feed, and Modern Mouse Josh on his Twitter. Did I get all those right? That is all correct. Ah, man. See, you do the show enough times, and I can do your... I can do your promo for you. Hey, perfect. Sweet. I'll just hang back and drink my coffee. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll, we will hear more about what Josh is up to at the tail end of this show. But let's get into the Northman review. So before we get into spoilers, the Northman is another entry into an extensive Viking catalog that's uh, a lot of Viking content that's out there right now for some reason. Netflix has like two or three Viking shows. I watched The Last Kingdom. Not realizing there was another Viking show. I'm like, holy cow. There's so many Viking things. Um, but this film, The Northman, is a film that's based off a Scandinavian legend. Um, although I will say that it's more in the setup than anything else. Because based on what I read about that legend, like it's very different from what you get in this film. Um, also, Shakespeare did base Hamlet off that legend as well. But I feel like The Northman is closer to Hamlet than it is to the original version of that mythology. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Um, this was directed by Robert Eggers, and it follows Amleth as he attempts to exact revenge against the uncle who killed his father and kidnapped his mother. That is not a spoiler, by the way, because that is in the trailer. So it is, uh, it is very much something that um, they're very upfront with. Uh, I do want to get into a few facts about the film before we review it. We did get a hey guys from a Facebook user, and I'm going to guess that that's Dale Wentland. So Dale, what is up? StreamYard doesn't always show me who's commenting on things, by the way. So um, I'm assuming that that's Dale. And what is up, Dale? Dale's a friend of both Josh's and mine. A few facts about this movie, Josh, and you could probably add to some of these facts because you're a Robert Eggers fan, but this is the third Robert Eggers feature film, which is remarkable for the fact of how talented this guy is. The Witch, his first film, is a horror movie that had a budget of $4 million. Now, that may sound like a lot of money to you, but in the world of Hollywood, $4 million nothing. for a movie is nothing. Yeah. Um, and by the way, it made 10 times that amount in theaters, which is kind of why he's becoming the golden boy, so to speak, in Hollywood. Although we'll get into this a little bit more. His second film, The Lighthouse, 
is almost indescribable. <laughs> I'll go with mythological psychological thriller as this genre, but even that is yeah. like not the correct description for what that is. It is a bizarre, it is a bizarre genre <laughs> of film. It, it is really bizarre. And I also think like it didn't do as well, right, in theaters. It did not. It had a it had a budget of eleven million dollars, but it made eighteen. So it, it was still profitable. Like it was still a profitable film. Um now, The Northman is Egger's first studio-backed films. Uh, first of his studio-backed films. I'm sure he'll do many more. Um, and it came with a $90 million budget. So he's up the budget by, you know, a factor of nine. Um, a little under nine. And as of yesterday, The Northman has only made $31 million in the U.S. and $58 million worldwide. So the travesty of this, in my opinion, Josh Taylor, is that yeah. Doctor Strange in the, in the Multiverse of Madness has made close to $300 million just domestically and almost $700 million internationally. And I say that's a tragedy because The Northman is a way better film <laughs> than Doctor Strange is, in my opinion. And I say that as someone, of course, all these people who listen to, a, to me on this show know that I love the MCU. But this is a phenomenal film. So how about we get into a review of The Northman, Josh? What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. I'm stoked to talk about this film. Cool. So we'll stay spoiler-free for a little bit. So I'd love to hear what did you think of it, Josh? No spoilers, but what did you think of The Northman? And yeah. should people go see this film? So the thing about Robert Eggers, if you've never seen a Robert Eggers film, the thing to love most about his films is that he captures – a place and time mm. so well um mm. the witch was a film that the dialogue fit the 1600s 1700s and so it wasn't for everybody um because of the dialogue it felt very shakespearean in that regard mm. and the lighting the the music that went along with it everything that was atmospheric about that film felt old um and because it's kind of a horror film, it felt a little weird. Um, you didn't really know what was going on. The same thing can be said about The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse becomes this psychedelic, wild thing. Like as, <laughs> as you're watching these characters fall into their own psychosis, you yourself are watching and you would believe that you have some kind of psychosis. Um, <laughs> It's it's weird, but this film does the same thing. It creates a really great atmosphere, mm. even though it's not based on Hamlet. A lot of people are going to make that, you know, assumption mm. that like, oh, this is just like Hamlet, even if mm. they don't know the legend. And I think a part of that comes from also the style of dialogue that he chooses for this film mm. feels very Shakespearean, mm. um, still and. The way that it's shot, the color grading of the film, everything feels like you're in the North Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a beautifully shot. It feels old. It feels gritty. He nailed the atmosphere. He nailed what it's like. I mean, I don't know what it was like to live in Viking days. Oh, come on, Josh. You're a Viking. I, I, can, see, I can see you're a berserker just by looking at you. Right, exactly. <laughs> but like, it did feel like the brutality of what life was like at that time. Yeah, made sense in the film. So, yeah. to me, the fun of going to see a Robert Eggers film is being able to live with these characters. Right. Um, I don't think that he's a strong writer of protagonists you really want to root for. <laughs> You know, right. like nobody in this film was, I was like, yeah, that's, I'm so excited for them. Um, but like, and we are going to get into that very, very deeply, by the way. So yeah, but yeah. I, I do enjoy sitting and watching one of those films and like coming out of it going like, I don't think I could have lived during that time period. I would be dead now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I made that joke about you being a berserker is because you're one of the most kind-hearted, gentle timid. people that I know. No, I wouldn't call you timid. I wouldn't any, anybody who puts them out puts themselves out on a podcast all the time, I would not call timid. I would sure. say that you are you're just very chill, very mild-mannered, like very interested yeah. in a good conversation. And <laughs> these people aren't. <laughs> these people are aggressive. They're crazy. They don't even talk about stuff very much. I mean, it's it's insane. Um by the way, a couple things to just to pick up on uh, that I learned in researching 
preparing for this show and researching some things. Um, Robert Eggers is, he describes himself as someone who is interested in um, history, spirituality, and mythology, who just happens to make films. So yeah. you can see as you as you talk about like the kinds of movies that he's making here, he has a very uh, rooted interest in being historically accurate to the point where he in The Witch, which I've never seen, by the way, it's the only movie of his I haven't seen yet. Um, it's a film. I'm just not a horror guy. So I'm like, do I, I want to put I, myself through three days of anxiety <laughs> for just to watch this guy's movie? Um, but one of the things he said was he he they he uses dialogue that is almost literally taken from uh, the writings of people at that, at the time of the time period. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like in, and actually he played a clip of the, one of the female characters is actually saying almost identically what a uh, Puritan person of that time frame had written down. It was a male. So it wasn't, it was a different kind of character and all kind of thing uh, about a different kind of situation, but so he's very interested in being as um, immersive in that regard as possible. Obviously, he loves Shakespeare. Obviously, right? Because he just it just seeps into these films. Um, I will say a couple things. Uh, I I totally agree with you that it is visually gorgeous. I don't think that I have ever been as impressed visually with a filmmaker as I've been with Robert Eggers, as except in maybe some. Um, some unique places where I think Zack Snyder gets there as well. Like the way that he, the way that he displays activity on screen is interesting just because of the way he imagined it in his head. Um, and it's, and it's, it's striking. It's like, like he was complaining cause he filmed the witch um, in digital and he's filmed the Northman in uh, on film. Um, and the way that his brain works from a technical standpoint is very unique. So this, this film is visually gorgeous. It is, by the way, what I thought the Green Knight was going to be. And the Green Knight I was ultimately disappointed in because I, 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 I'm very um, – I used to be a really big fan of Arthurian lore. So I just would I I would dive into uh, Arthurian lore. I wrote a couple stories about Arthur, Arthurian lore, and I thought the Green Knight was trying to do what Robert Eggers accomplished in The Northman. Basically, is what I kind of how I kind of felt about that. Extraordinary acting in this. Um, Anna Taylor Joy was discovered by ro discovered by. Obviously, she was talented to begin with, um, but he's the first person to put her in a feature. So she was in The yeah. Witch. Yep. She's outstanding in this. Um, I think uh, Alexander Skarsgård as uh, as Amleth is outstanding. The, Nicole Kidman, who you've never seen in a role like this, <laughs> like Not you've never seen Nicole Kidman do this, she's phenomenal. Um, and probably, probably, if if I were going to say like, hey, look does this movie deserve any sort of Oscar consideration? I would have said Nicole Kidman is supporting is like almost like a lock for me. I mean, really? Yeah. Just because she's not a major character in this. Let's be fair yeah, about that. I mean, that. it would be a supporting role for sure. Yes. But I've never like, I, I did you see the movie where she plays um, Lucy, Lucille Ball? I have not yet. No, but okay. she's having like a really interesting it's not a comeback because I wouldn't say that she went right. away, but she's having like a resurgence. Yes. Um, in roles that I would have never put her in, but at the same time, she's—I mean, I believe she's had like quite a bit of plastic surgery. Yeah. So, um, the roles that she was getting, I don't think are there for her anymore. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is fine, right? Because I think she's getting way cooler roles on the way other better side roles. Of it. Yeah, way better roles. Yeah. Well. Well, she was great in that movie, and she got a supporting. I would tell you that what she does in The Northman, I think, is more impressive than what she did in in that movie. So okay. for me, um, just because of who she is, I mean, we're talking about you know what I expect to see Nicole Kidman as is goes back all the way to like Far and Away. That's what I expect to see her doing. Yeah, what she does in The Northman <laughs> is not that. Um, Several of the scenes I think in this film are mind-blowingly powerful scenes. 
which are which are just great. You mentioned this, but his ability to light a scene. Uh. You, do you do you know uh, there's a there's a style of painting wherein the actual light source is not the light source. I don't know what this is called because I'm not an art historian, but usually they will like put a put a light source like in a portion of the um portion of the painting where there is like let's just say that there's a painting of like the nativity right and it's like the little baby jesus is the light source like that kind of thing where yeah. it's like there's shat there's shadow in the background but clearly like the baby would never be the source of light that style of painting which is very dynamic is like what you're watching when you're watching a robert eggers film you're like i'm zoned in on the thing i'm supposed to be zoned in on it is it is i, I, I the title of this youtube video is uh beautifully a brutally beautiful right like it's be it's brutally beautiful it's not beautiful inherently because i'm sitting by a stream feeling peaceful i feel very uncomfortable with the visuals but you're so compelled to watch them and so the way he uses lighting i think is just phenomenal there's a scene where it is literally a fire and a close up of is is an extended scene so this is not the entire scene but there's a fire and there's a close up a close up of amleth and you're just like there's nothing else going on on the screen. This dude's looking at the camera. He's looking at me, and it's it's insane how much emotion and 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 conflict there is just by a guy standing in front of the fire looking at me. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that actually because he's filming actors looking directly at the camera, it does make you as an audience member almost uh, it's almost uh, participatory. <laughs> You're like almost participating in the madness that is happening on the screen, right? You're like, whoa, I'm seeing what he's seeing. Uh, or she's seeing or whatever. So I do think that this is also about spirituality and destiny and humanity, which we'll get into later when we start talking spoilers. I'm always down to talk about those kind of things. Um, I will say that I do have one minor issue with the film, and it is about the premise of the film and whether or not we should... You you alluded to this already, which is why I said we'll talk about it, and we will. But whether or not you should actually root for and or celebrate the protagonist or condemn the protagonist it's it's and i want to talk about that so we'll talk about that a little bit um yeah but i think josh said it like don't go into this film thinking we're rooting for iron man like you know what i mean like that's not it's not this kind of I film mean, here's the thing. you could root you could root <laughs> for someone in this movie but by the end of this film you might think very differently exactly exactly which is which is both awesome and presents some problems i think for modern day film um so what's your take one of the best movies of 2022 so, thus far this is a, uh, so i wouldn't say you said it's your favorite right or that it is your best of so far so far of what i've seen yes uh i would say it's top five i would ah. not say i here's what i would say about this film I yeah. feel the same way about this film that I felt about The Lighthouse and that I feel about The Witch. Yeah. I walked out of these films, all yeah. of them, going, yeah, that was fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not fun, you know, but, like, I enjoyed seeing <laughs> right. the film. Right. But, like, as I, especially The Witch. The Witch was a film where, like, the more I sat and thought about it, the more I was like, this was a beautifully told story. Yeah, in every way. Um, and the lighthouse was a movie that I kind of, you know, knowing Robert Eggers now, I knew yeah. what I was getting into a bit more. Yeah. This film, I walked out going, okay, that was fun. And then like, as I sat on it, as I compared it to other mythologies, Shakespeare literature in general, how like it is a classically told, mm. perfect story. Yeah. Um, is it the best story ever? I mean, it's not really original. It is Hamlet, right. um, which, you know, is been told a bunch of different times. But I did right. really, really enjoy it. I would say, yeah, top five for sure. It might sneak okay. up more as the year goes on. Okay. So what, what would you say? You say, what should I go see before I see The Northman? I would say that everyone should see everything everywhere all at once. That oh, I can't wait. Yeah. was so brilliant, so wonderful. Um, but this film is, I think this film is one of those films that people are going to be surprised at the end of the year that like it either does get nominations for something or it yeah. doesn't at all. Right, right. It's going to go one way or the other. 
And either way, people are going to be surprised. They'll be like, oh, I forgot that movie came out. Or they'll be like, the Northman got robbed. What the heck? Yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah, I, I think it's my favorite film because I haven't seen everything everywhere all at once. Um, nor have I seen the unbearable weight of massive talent. I haven't seen yeah. that either. And I think that I will probably enjoy those two films quite a bit. So I'm I'm saying it's my favorite film of 2022, having seen very few films in 2022 and being ha, and having been slightly disappointed in most of the ones that I've seen thus far. So the great thing just, about you saying that though is that the films that you either A think are the best films of the year or B have seen and think it's one of the best films of the year are not big franchise films. Right. Like, this is a year that really feels like uh, not independent film. This is obviously like, you know, made from a studio, but like regular films that aren't attached to like years worth of story building and yes. characters that we know yeah. are, are finally getting some real traction. It's kind of nice and refreshing. I think the marketplace is really hungry for different things, different visions, different ways of pulling things off. Um, it's going to mean that we have a lot more uh, diverse feelings about the movies that we see because they're going to hit us so differently. But I think that we're in a place where I'm hoping that Hollywood will think we should we should live into this as opposed to uh, backing away from it. Um, by the way, I should also say um, we are going to react to the She-Hulk trailer as well. But I'll save that till after the Northman just because we're already we're already into that. I was going to do it first and I forgot. Um, but there, that's 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 like the opposite of. In many regards, that's like the opposite of what we're talking about with the Northman, right? Like it's an established property made by an established firm. It is different. It is taking some swings, but we'll get into that later. Sure. Um, for now, I am going to give a spoiler warning on the Northman. So we are going to get into spoilers from here on out. If you haven't seen it yet, you might want to bounce um, and uh, go see it. Go see it. I think you will really enjoy it. Probably not a good movie to take the kids to. <laughs> not at all. No. Not at all. Um, maybe to leave the kids at home, but I think you will You will at least get something out of it. Um, so here's my question for you, Josh. The first question I have, first spoiler question. One thing Robert Eggers has said in interviews is that he's very interested in spirituality, mythology, um, history. And like we talked about earlier, that shows in his in his film – Here's my question, though, um, as it pertains to spirituality and mythology, and even to a certain extent, history. What do you think that the Northman has to say for the audience? What is the message this film is attempting to convey? That's really interesting. I mean, there's a lot more to it outside of of just like the time period, right? It can be mm -hmm. um, something that modern audiences can take away a lesson from. I think that like, and this is, I mean, I know we're in spoiler territory, so I feel like even weird saying it, but um, <laughs> the fact that in the beginning of the, I guess would be the last act of this film, yeah. you learn that Amleth's father was a slaver himself and that his mother was a slave. Yeah and that he's basically holding up the ideals of the same kind of person he's trying to fight yes um i mean you could take a lot away from that right like you could say yeah we we sometimes back people and if we really looked and think to, and, and thought about the politicians the celebrities the the friends the family whomever that we have the backs of mm. um whether mm. or not their intentions are good or bad and i think um uh this is uh whatever i don't care uh <laughs> so so my grandmother was not yeah. a very good person mm. um and when she died my family opted not to have a funeral now in part that was because you know, it was COVID times and no one mm. could go to a funeral, but we decided not to have any kind of celebration, anything. Mm -hmm. And I think in part that came from um, myself, my parents looking at her legacy and going like, what really was there to celebrate? Um, she didn't have a lot of friends. She didn't have a lot of people that loved her. And 
people would be there out of more obligation than they would anything else. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, it sounds cruel and mean, but at the same time, we didn't really want to celebrate a person not worth celebrating. Right. Um, but I think that, you know, that's a much more personal thing. Um, yeah. But like, even when you look at, I guess the better thing would be like politicians, right? Like who are you <laughs> right. really fighting for? And, uh, and is, are they worth fighting for? Begin yes. With. And are their ideals worth fighting for? Because uh, I think we get caught up in that loop sometimes. And yeah, you know, you got to like step away and see that perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I am in full agreement with you on this. And I kind of love what this film has to say. And I kind of hate what this film has to say. And I love the way I love the fact that the film makes me feel that way. Right. So Do you hate it because he makes the choice he makes in still moving forward with it. Like he, you know, the brutal killing of like everyone. Well, instead so, of just going off and being with the love of his life. So, 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 so let me show you how I get there. The first is I'm going to write out what I believe the premise of this film to be. So when I say premise, just so everyone knows, whenever I use the term premise, um, what I'm referring to is the specific shared experience that the film is trying to communicate to its audience, right? So the shared human experience that the film is trying to communicate through to its audience through the story. Uh, Leos Agree in his book, The Art of Dramatic Writing, has a way of talking about the premise. And it is basically like the traits of the character slash the values of the character when combined with a form of conflict have a result. That's the essence of storytelling. The character traits and actions and behaviors and values come up against conflict in some way, shape, or form, and then there is a result to that, right? And by the way, that's very Shakespearean because the art of dramatic writing was written to be based on stage plays. It just so happens that it applies to all kinds of stories. Um, so in, so this is, my, this is my take on the premise of this film. Vengeance, even when satisfying the person who wants revenge, is ultimately cold comfort and damaging to relationships and I think you could possibly say, and the rest of the world at large. <laughs> um, now, the art of this premise is that each character has a different perspective on this premise, right? Um, in other words, if I, if I were to if I were to kind of run through this, if I was going to going to run through this and say like what all these characters are dealing with, Amleth dies thinking he did the right thing. Amleth is celebrating himself when he dies. He's looking at himself as saying like, wow, I accomplished the thing that I set out to accomplish. I am going to uh, Valhalla. They call it something slightly different than that, probably because it's more accurate. Um, but he, I believe that Amleth thinks that he's not only justified in the human sense, but also that he, sp he comes up with a spiritual perspective that also tells him he's justified in doing what he's doing. Um, but if you look at every other character here, his mother, who he's trying to save, who you brought up, the best twist of the whole film, it has to deal with his mother. She doesn't agree with him at all. She thinks that his father was basically, like you said, he's repeating the sins of his father, and those were atrocious, and she had to deal with that trauma. So she doesn't think he's right, and she thinks that she's backed by the spiritual perspective that she has to say that she's right. Her husband also believes that he's right. Her husband, it's really interesting the way the film does this, because we're made to believe that, that Amleth's uncle, who ends up being his stepdad. <laughs> uh, we, we're led to believe that he's a horrific human being. But if you look at where he's at, he has removed himself from all major wars. He's living on a farm. He's trying to take care of people. Um, now, he's a little bit brutal with some of the slaves that he takes on, right? So we can we can criticize him there. But he, he seems like a much gentler person than we ever would have imagined him being. Um, and At least gentler than... The other people of that time period that we've seen correct I, and that's where robert e robert eggers gives us a place and time where you go everyone's a bit brutal here yes this guy yes. is the least brutal so you still don't <laughs> yeah. really want to root for him but like he's not nearly as bad as you might think 
Exactly. Exactly. Um, and so it's this, it's this, it's this interesting thing, right? Because all of these characters believe a thing, but they all believe that they're right in believing the thing that they believe. But Amleth is the only one who gets what he wanted. Amleth, Amleth's uncle believes he's right, but he dies after seeing his family murdered. Amleth's uh, mother informs him that his father was awful, which we talked about already, and, th and that his uncle is great, but she dies after seeing the only child she really loves murdered. Amleth's girlfriend believes that his children are his destiny, that he should give up his pursuit, but he ignores and abandons her. The only person who gets what they want in this film and believes he's justified in it is Amleth. So here, here's my problem. I think that the premise of the film is brilliant and well stated and well told of a story about how it plays out. But the reason I hate the premise is because I think and this I can't control this, right? I struggle I struggle with this in my own writing. I think the I think that some people seeing this film will say, what a great revenge film. Amleth got everything he wanted. Cool. And and that is basically not understanding the story, which means that Robert Eggers is sort of a little bit off the hook in that regard. But it's like what people thought the Joker was going to be, right? Like people thought the Joker was going to be like justification of the Joker. It ended up, I don't think, being that. I think basically that film pretty clearly stated that like this is a psychotic human being and we shouldn't be like him. This film, though, is a little bit, it paints Amleth in a, in a light where you could, if you wanted to, believe that he was right and got what he wanted and it was heroic in some way, shape, or form. And that hurts me a little bit because I don't want people to think that. <laughs> right? So, so yeah, yeah, I agree with you. So here's, the, here's my hope. I guess yes. I don't know if this will happen or not. The Joker is very much a, because everybody understands who Batman is. Yeah. It's a super approachable film. For, yes. ev for everybody. Yes. Because this film uses Shakespearean type of English, um, it switches sometimes between that and actual Norse uh, terms, you know, yeah. Norse languages. Um, and then it has this kind of artsiness about it. That's just who Robert Eggers is. It's less approachable. Yeah than the Joker is. And so my yeah, hope very much. is that the wrong audience doesn't <laughs> find this film <laughs> because there, there definitely is a, well, you know, if I just murder everybody, yeah. um, <laughs> right. I end up at the gates of heaven. Yes. So perfect. Correct. Correct. The, do you think, okay, so I understand what you're saying and I, I totally get where you're going. There are a couple of different options that, as a filmmaker or as a writer, you could have gone down. Yeah. And it could have fixed that very easily. Yes. So one is that he chooses not to go back. Yeah. Um, if you've not seen the film and you you have at this point decided, you know, I don't care about spoilers. I just want to hear what you guys have to say. So there's a point in the <laughs> right, film. Right, right, right. <laughs> there's a point in the film where Amalith um, takes Olga, Anya Taylor Joy. And yeah. his girlfriend, basically his, his, yeah, basically like these two people who have fallen in love, um, they run off and they get in a little boat and basically they've kind of decided like, we're just going to live a new life. Yeah. And then they get about, I don't know, what would you say? Like 300 feet out into the ocean. <laughs> and he goes, not very far. He goes, nah, I got to go back and murder people. <laughs> right. So, at that point, you go like, okay, well, you could have just stayed on the boat. But I understand yes. that's not the uh, relief of an ending that you might want. Right. The other ending that you get is this fight scene Yeah. Uh, on the side of a volcano, the gates to hell. And both he and his uncle die, which right. is fine. At that point... You could do that. You could cut to black. Right. And and that's your fine story. Right. But then it shows a Valkyrie yeah. um, hoisting him up to, to Valhalla, to the gates of heaven. Yeah. And I think that that is the one thing that if you took that part out. Yeah. Because, yeah, you're right. Like, in the sense, 
all of these problematic things that he's done, all the killing and murdering and bloodshed that's happened, right. is now justified. Right. Um, not just for him, but for a portion of the audience that yes. might go see this film. Yes. And he's not right. In, <laughs> right. In, I mean... Even Robert Eggers would, would for sure tell you that he's not right. No. And I think that that is... The thing about a Robert, Robert Eggers film, all three of his films, there is nobody in any of his films where at the end of it you go... Yeah, that guy. That was right. that was <laughs> right. the person that was right. Like, uh, right. I mean, Olga, Anya Taylor Joy's character, might be the only person in this film that you could have any kind of sympathy for. Correct. Right. Like, Correct. she's just a slave, and then she becomes impregnated, and she's excited about this new life that she's going to lead, and now she's left with two children, yeah. and being a single mother. Right. Uh, and possibly who knows what her where her life leads her to will she become a slave again like who knows right um but the you know every main character that you're supposed to be rooting for really right. is not worthy yeah and i think for me personally like how would i have ended it differently and this is not necessarily better because i think that robert eggers is actually trying to prove a point um in the ending of this film but i probably would have ended it myself in him not getting a reward for his behavior. I think the reason why Robert Eggers ends with him getting the reward for his behavior, which is kind of going to get into my second topic a little bit more, is because I believe partially what Robert Eggers is trying to say, and I think this is true of all of his films thus far, not having seen The Witch and just hearing him talk about it, I kind of can see this as a central theme, and that is almost all human beings are presented with value systems and beliefs, particularly those who are spiritual, but it could be anybody, even if you're atheist or agnostic, this could still be you, where they start governing your behavior so much that it gives a force feedback loop of positive affirmation that what you believe is right and must be true, and that everything else that's happening around you must be related to that belief. So like I don't I've seen clips from the witch haven't seen the whole movie of the witch but it's kind of obvious that the witch when you think that this that that your bad luck is attributed to the devil you will start to see the world through those eyes and see every negative thing that happens in your life be spiritual forces working against you even if it's your own bad choices even if it's your own uh if it's your own sin that the devil didn't do anything you just you just can't be a perfect person and you just do some bad things but if, when you can place that on something else and then give yourself a feedback loop about it and i think that that's essentially what robert eggers is saying here is that amleth is not that much unlike a suicide bomber that you might see in real life it's You've been promised this thing. You're going to get this thing. You now believe as an extremist that that is what what you are. And the human brain in its in its throes of death, could it could it then conjure up the vision that this is what you're going to go get? I think what he's saying is is that he's saying for Amleth for this character who believes that he is imbued with spiritual purpose, even though all the characters think that. By the way, and this is where I think the the premise wins he still shouldn't be doing these things, but is because of his religious conviction. And I think that that's a, it's a fascinating way to end the film, but I do think it causes some, it causes, it It begs the question, should they have not shown him getting the reward? Because earlier in the film, it sort of shows him dreaming of getting that reward. And I think it would have been better if he had had that dream of getting that reward, but never actually gotten it. And I almost wonder if we could talk to Robert Eggers, if he would say, I probably would have ended it there, but the studio made me put the other part of it in. Maybe. I wonder but, about that. But I think, um, I mean, like, I know you haven't seen The Witch. And I don't want to spoil The Witch for anybody. But you're right in the sense of that story is about you creating the devil that you become. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and like, it is that it is. If you continue to believe in it, there is some justification there. There is some truth to it. Yeah. And this film does a lot of that same kind of thing. If you believe so fully mm -hmm. in your own belief system, 
then nothing else matters. Um, and that's the reason why you could have slaves during that time period. And, yeah. and like, I know that it's different than the American, like African slave trade. Yes, but very like, different. It is in and of itself still a, we believe these people are slaves because of our religious beliefs and their religious beliefs and how they're right. different. Right. Um, we believe that we should be kings because, you know, of Norse mythology. Yep. In our connection to it. Um, everyone has their destiny. And then you have these kind of like witch doctor characters who <laughs> yeah. can talk to the gods and, and it's all, um, it's all very interesting in what people believe or not believe. And I agree that I think maybe the visual components of the ending might've come from the studio. Yeah. But at the same time, Robert Eggers is the kind of person who dabbles in what's real and what's not. Yes. Um, so was his ascension to Valhalla real or was that just him believing still? Yeah. You know, exactly. like in his last moments of life, like do we, uh, it, it's not the reward, but do we just believe right. that we can go? Well, and another, another take on it could have been too. you know, show, show that because he believes that's going to happen. Show that, show the Valkyrie taking him to Valhalla and then cut back to his lifeless corpse decomposing, right? Like, like sure. this is what yeah, he, yeah, yeah. this is what actually is, you know, something along those lines. But right. to capitalize on this, um, and to 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 kind of uh, maybe calcify our thoughts around this, one of the things that Alexander Skarsgård said in an interview with the Empire Podcast that I listened to, shout out to our friends at Empire Podcast, um, I found this fascinating. He said atheists and agnostics didn't exist in this culture at this time. And so this film is full of spirituality. So since we're already on that topic, what did you think of that as it pertained to the story? As far as the religious aspect of it? Just the just the, the the take that like the take that there isn't a single person in this entire film who does not believe that there are spiritual implications. This is all Norse spiritual implications, yeah. if you will. And they're shown to be true. They're shown that the, there actually is Norse gods and the gods are doing something. They're influencing these people's lives in some way, shape, or form. So how does that how does that sit with you? How does it resonate with you? How does it work as a storytelling device? It's fine. I think that that is, um, it goes along with telling this kind of story, right? Like it, mm. it I believe, um, I mean, I don't have to believe in the reality of gods and monsters or whatever to then see it on screen and be like, oh, yeah, I enjoy this. You know, like to me, this is a fictional story and it just so happens to deal with mysticism and Norse mythology and things like that. It just makes sense. Um, if you're going from like a reality based side of things, like, sure, I, I'm sure that there were people of that time period that were like, I don't know, these this gods thing is kind of weird. Like, <laughs> you know, like, why are we blaming everything on like a on a god of war and uh, some weird volcanoes and stuff like that? But <laughs> I do understand why people thought the way that they thought at that time, you know, or like right. in, in any time, really, like why people believe uh or have a need for religion at all right um to add it into the like if you were to make i guess you could say this mm -hmm. even though it's a real stretch but i'm gonna i'm <laughs> gonna make this stretch anyway yeah this film is to norse mythology mm. as god's not dead <laughs> is to christianity <laughs> now I need again, to make this. A, this is my real. Already, I want to make this my real. Again, I understand it's a stretch, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. if you go with it, any kind of Christian movie or whatever, the things that are the mystical elements of religion yeah. happen, and you just go with it because you're like, right, right, right. this is the story they're trying to tell. Yeah. It's the same thing here, but of course, we don't because we now see Norse mythology as mythology and not as a religion. 
Right. We see it more as a story element than we see as a propaganda for some kind of, you know, yeah. like, uh, yeah. which is fine. It's fine. Like, it's totally fine. I think that you can make that kind of justification and it's okay. Yeah. Um, if you were to go back in time, if you were to somehow magically go back in time to the age of Vikings and make a movie and then be like, tell me about your religion. And then you fictionalized it. Uh, maybe people would feel a little bit different at that time, right. but they also might be thinking like, what's a camera. So, <laughs> you know, right. it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a good, I think it's a good comparison to God is not dead because I, I shouldn't. Well, let me let me let me rephrase. That's it is that's, a that's comparison. An, that's an out of context. That is an out of context statement. Um, it is uh, what Amleth believes about his spirituality is similar to what people in the modern day believe about their spirituality relative to God is not dead. That's how the right. that's how the two tie together, right? Like, and 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 I haven't seen that film, but having seen you know a handful of Christian films, I can tell you that. Um, they usually are far more politically motivated than they are spiritually motivated. And I can back that up re with receipts. If anybody wants to challenge me on that, please come on the show because I'll challenge you all day long. Um, but so in, I, I think you're, you're, you, you're, you and I are on the same page here. And, and let me explain how I was going to explain it. I loved, I loved the way he addressed it for two different reasons. And they're the same reasons that you're kind of suggesting. One is that it resonates with people who are very spiritual and it resonates with people who are atheists. And here's how it does that. One, for a spiritual person, it's going to say, it's saying that spirituality is real and has an impact on the lives of those involved. Um, and it does, it does. It's saying that like this, it's, it's like, the, it's, like um, it's similar to the force in Star Wars. If you're a spiritual person, you can say, I understand what they're trying to say. It's not my religion, but I get that there are spiritual forces and that those have an impact on us. Um, but if you're not spiritual, if you're more of an atheist or an agnostic, you can look at this film and also say, look at the madness of spirituality and what religion can drive people to in their becoming zealots for their for their faith, right? It, it, it resonates from both sides because it it feels very true to the human experience, no matter what side you fall on. Right. Um, and I think that that's why it works. It doesn't, the people who are in the film who are spiritual are not without sin. And their view on the spiritual is almost always shown to be untrue, except for that final scene where the Valkyrie actually takes him off, right? That's the, maybe the only one that doesn't resonate as much because it, it's like, oh, the, the conclusion was he was supposed to do all of these horrific things as if it could justify a suicide bomber, right? Like it's, and, and that's where it's the only scene that probably doesn't work in that regard. But every other scene kind of showcases to you he has a deeply held spiritual belief. He has faith in something. He acts on that faith. And sometimes it doesn't seem like he should have acted on that faith. Like it seems like that was like a miss, a missed opportunity for him. And yet it was very meaningful and real to him. So I think that's why it tends to resonate. It's because it's very human in its in its examples of what it gives us. So um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with you, basically. <laughs> Can I also I just want to point this out? And this yeah. is totally uh, this is totally not what we were talking about at all. Yeah, yeah. But one of the things uh, when you were watching the film first before yes. I did, and this was, I mean, you saw um, The Lighthouse not too long ago. Not right? too long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty recently. <clears throat> and I told you, I, I believe I told you this, that mm -hmm. like there are certain visual elements that will stick with you yeah. from a Robert Eggers film. And I think that that's, I, to me, it's always something awful and brutal um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, I, I won't spoil anything for the witch or for the lighthouse but there are moments in those films that will never leave my brain yeah um they're fantastic to look at but also like you have to be like oh like <laughs> i didn't yeah. think they could do that in a movie <laughs> uh i did think they could do this in a movie but there's the fight as I'm I'm now going to call it the revenge of the Sith fight because it mm. just like they have this end duel on the yes. side of a volcano 
I turned to Jessica while it was happening. I'm like, dude, I feel like he's going to turn to me and be like, I have the high ground. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, he goes to, like, cut off his arm. I was just like, there's, like, an obsession here now. Like, he's going to yes. cut off, like, limbs. But um, the moment where I believe they're in silhouette, right? You just see the volcanic kind of red lighting yeah, from behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just slices this dude's head off <laughs> right but then you don't notice immediately that he's also been stabbed right right and so like he slices this dude's head off his uncle's head off yeah and his uncle's body just like falls and collapses <laughs> yeah. but this spear is still in him right and it was just brutal yeah and like i love I love Robert Eggers for that kind of visual element. Yeah, and I'll yeah. never, I'll never forget that scene. By the way, this is basically you're segueing into my next question already, and I think that, that so, I, so I actually want to talk about this a little bit more because um, this is the quite. Let me just set up the question, and I'll, I'll give you some feedback on that particular thing. Um, the question is: What elements of the storytelling in the Northmen stand out to you, and why? Um, what does this cast and crew bring? Or, or do that brings this story to life and then is there anything done here that distracts from the storytelling and the overall meaning of the story so we've been talking about this a little bit off and on but it gives us a moment it gives us a minute to talk about the moments of the film right and this is my last question so this is so we're, we're in good territory here and to your point i kept hearing that this film is like, this film is so brutal. Like it's the most brutal th thing you've ever seen on film. I can't even believe they did some of these things. It was so crazy and so dark and blah, blah, blah. And I watched the whole film and I thought, oh, I, I, I didn't feel that way at all. The What I felt was that a filmmaker who can show you something that is done with such beautiful rendering of visual images that also happens to be very brutal does something to you that a filmmaker who just shows you someone's guts fall out can't do right. because because if someone's guts fall out in a film it can't make you just feel an emotion just because there are guts on screen except for maybe disgust right like maybe most sure. people would feel disgust but what robert eggers can do and which is why so many people are calling this film so disturbing and dark and gross and grotesque it's it's mild in comparison to some it's mild in comparison to event horizon event horizon's yeah. way worse why is this film so hard hitting to you though because robert eggers made you feel something while he showed you that and so that's the thing that i think that um that really and it's not just you can take it from the brutal the brutality aspects of the film and say the same thing you know, you can watch you can watch um, Mortal Kombat a thousand times and never feel what you feel watching The Northman. And so, for me, so for me, those things are also not just related to the brutal aspects of the film, but also the the beautiful, haunting thought-provoking moments of the film as well. So I'll, I'll give you my two favorite moments of the film, and then we can talk about some more favorite moments that you had. Yeah. My two favorite moments of this film are when he goes to see the female shaman who doesn't have eyes, um, played sure. by Bjork, by the way. <laughs> yeah, crazy. The way that film, the way that scene is filmed is, it's almost as if you have entered the realm of the oracle if we were living in a greek or, or roman type of thing and that you are hearing from her talking to you about what your life could be or what your spiritual journey could look like yeah. filmed with her facing the camera filmed with her talking to you as the audience filmed in a way that is so hauntingly beautiful in a character design production design that is so stunning that it is it will sit with you as if like, what does it look like to hear from spiritual people in your life? And what would that do to you if you could? And what if it was scary to hear it? Because the person even telling you looks frightful, right? Like yeah. um, there's that scene. My other favorite scene, interestingly enough, they were both filmed with the blue tone, which um, 
I have to think about that for a little bit for a little while. But when he goes down into the cave to get the sword and has mm-hmm. to fight the uh, the giant Viking, mm-hmm. um, the undead giant Viking, oh, dude, I could watch that all day long. That is so cool. So those are my two favorite. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of other stuff that's that's tied in. Um, you're, the scene that you just brought up, in, insanely brutal. Um, the scene where uh, there's a couple other brutal scenes. The the scene where the slaver is going to take Anna Taylor Joy's character to basically uh, be forced to have sex with the uncle. Again, yeah. not a great guy, even though he's living on a farm. Um, what she does to that guy <laughs> is so gross, but gets her point across so well that you're just like, oh, that's brutal. And I don't think I've ever seen that on film. But like it again, it isn't so it isn't that it's so disgusting as it is that it makes sense in that moment that she would do that. And then it goes along with the character. And that's not filmed in a super artistic way, by the way. That's just filmed in a very because the, her point is not. His point and her point, meaning Robert Eggers' point and the the sure. character in that moment, the point is to be, I am a normal female and I'm gross. It's, it's supposed to be what she's communicating to the slaver. I'm a normal female. It's, it's, she's on her period, okay? Um, for those of you who haven't seen it and still don't care about being spoiled. Um, and so, for example, what she's trying to display to that guy is not supposed to be haunting. It's not supposed to be scary. It's not supposed to be. It's just supposed to be a base reaction to that's gross. And of course, no one wants no. The the guy's not going to want to have sex with her now, right? Like that's what it's supposed to tell you. Um, I should I should have put a PG thirteen rating on the podcast. I didn't even think about it. Um, but uh, but I thought that the so I like the hauntingly beautiful moments, obviously. But there are so many moments that make sense for the scene, both from a spiritual emotional and viewership perspective of what's going on so tell me tell me some more about some of your other favorite moments here um my other favorite scene actually i thought you were going to bring this up but you didn't yeah is uh there's two and i think that Mm. there's actually a really interesting point to make with one of them so the one that doesn't have a point to it i just enjoy it yeah is (laughs) when he's with the he's basically been abandoned as a child right he goes and and leaves yeah. And he gets picked up by all of these other kind of Viking people. Yeah. And they go and brutalize a town. Yes. And the camera follows him and all yeah. of his movements, right? Right. And so you just watch him, like, cut down people left and right. <laughs> yeah. And it was just cool. Like, yeah. it yeah, was yeah, at yeah. that point where you go, like, I'm on your side. I get where you're going. Yeah. This guy's cool. Maybe vengeance is cathartic is the question you ask yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, The other thing that will stick out with me for a long time as well. And we didn't even talk about Ethan Hawke, who initially plays like his father, the original King. Right. Who's fantastic. Who's just having, again, like a resurgence and deserves all kinds of praise for everything he's doing. Yes. But, um, he takes his son, young Amleth, and they go to. Um, oh yeah, yeah. They yeah. go to Willem Dafoe, right? And they're in this little yeah. cave, and he. They go through this whole ceremonial, like, are you a wolf? Are you a dog? Or you, you know, like your your animal instincts are there. Yes. And you need to have. Uh, they get across this point that in order to be a king in order yeah. to be um, someone worth anything in this world. Right. That you need to have a sense of your animalistic characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. And the film continues to have that. He continues to, throughout the entire film, um, show that he's this wolf type man that he's or (laughs) bear or whatever right like he's animalistic and he's not afraid of that side of of who he is right and i think there's something honest about that yes but at the same time something really uncomfortable yes about a man who 
believes so much that like we are animals, which we are all animals, uh, but believing that like he's justified in his brutality because of that animal. Yeah, yeah is a exactly. bit troubling. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of people who also think like that in the yeah. real world, and that's a, a bit unsettling. Yeah, really powerful scene. Again, uh, for some reason, Willem Dafoe is in a Robert Eggers film calling people dogs. <laughs> and just <laughs> Which, being crazy. And just being crazy. He does the same thing in The Lighthouse. You didn't go swab the floors, dog. Um, I don't do a good Willem Dafoe as doing whatever impression Willem Dafoe is doing yeah, in but the that's, moment. Yeah, that was fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but really great scene. And I do think that too, like I do think that too, again, Eggers is doing something. I'm really glad you brought this up because I had not thought of this until now, but I, but it resonates with me. In every movie, because even the witch, based on my understanding of the witch, there is a talking goat, right? There's a yeah. goat that, yeah. that is representative of the devil. Minor spoiler alert, but that's an old film. Um in the lighthouse. Willem Dafoe's character treats Robert Pattinson's character as if he's not worthy of being a human until he proves himself worthy. And he is a dog. Um, in this film, again, the bear wolf combo is what Amleth embraces to do what he's going to do. And I do think that this is a, something that Eggers is suggesting that is a core question for human beings to consider are we part of the animal kingdom or are we separate from the animal kingdom as humans? And that, by the way, is going to be a spiritually impacted to some degree answer to the question or because you're going to say, no, there's no such thing as spirituality. And therefore the answer to that question is there is only an animal world and humans are part of it because there is only one type of thing. For I think for a lot of spiritual people, they're going to say, well, no, human beings are separate from the animal kingdom for some reason. We were imbued by the creator. We we are created differently by the creator. Whatever it is, you're going to come up with a different answer for that question than the, than the, than the atheist or the agnostic may put into it. And I think what Robert Eggers is, is sort of suggesting here is, isn't it easy for human beings to just act like animals? Isn't it interesting that if we were to act like animals, we feel bad, but what if we're just part of the animal kingdom? Like, it's a quintessential question that human beings have to be asking themselves because I described you, for example, as a person that I could never see doing <laughs> the things in this in this right. movie as a berserker. So I'm capable of them. I agree. I agree. I agree that you're capable of them. Um, I think that I think that every human being is capable of them. But it, it as, as you as you as you say something like that, I can't even imagine you doing it. And yet, there is a part of us that cannot resist animalistic behaviors right. that are negative to maybe us or people around us. And we and so there's this question of like, how do we have a thought that we need to be separated from that, and we need to be, for lack of a better term, better than that? And it's almost suggesting that that's not good enough, which some people will reject. But we have a thought that we shouldn't be base creatures, as you might see some of uh, the creatures around. My my dog, you know Gatsby. Gatsby's a little corgi uh, yeah. who was attacked by a pit bull. That pit bull just attacked him. Why? Because the pit bull wanted to. I don't, I don't, why not? He's fine, by the way. Um, Gatsby, on the other hand, goes and messes with crickets, in the, and 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 he'll kill he'll kill one unintentionally, right? right. So that. But like, if you were to say to me, oh yeah, I went to the park today and um, I just like found it really interesting to mess around with this dog that I saw and I, oh, I by mistake killed it. I'd be like, Josh, you horrific person. What, what are you doing? You know, um, it would be, it would be shocking to me that that happened. So I do think that you're onto something here and that Eggers is playing with like, what does it mean to be animals? What does it mean to be not an animal? What does it mean to have someone who's also spiritual imbued with spiritual purpose, believe they need to take on the nature of animals to accomplish what they're going to do. Fascinating questions. I don't think he's giving us much answers, but I love the fact that he sets those up as questions to be considered. Again, I don't have an answer for this, but across all of his films, yeah. he's also used birds as the um, link to old souls. 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And in uh, all three of his films, again, my very minor spoilers for yeah for any of them, but right. um, I don't know what to make of that. I you know, but I think <laughs> right. I find it really interesting that that's something that he's continued. Yeah, and I think it's something that stands out in multiple mythologies. Yes, most you know, multiple people from around the world who never met each other. Yeah, believed that birds were capable of holding the souls of the dead. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. By the way, uh, fun fact. He said he would never work with goats again because goats are horrible on set. And he said that seagulls are actually really smart and can be well-trained and were great to work with. So there, so there you go. He said that in an interview. Um, so just a couple things that I wanted to point out. So I talked about like, and I'll get your take on this too. Anything else that like added to the story or distracted from it? I think that one of the things that, that adds a lot that other writers could I hope would also do, and I'm going to try to implement in my own writing is that every single character here has a clear perspective, objective and purpose. And they're trying to pursue that in light of whatever else is going on around them, which just makes every single character more compelling right off the bat. Um, I, we've already talked about this, but the visual presentation of these characters is some of the best that I've ever seen in a film. Um, not that many people are talking about Alexander Skarsgård. If this had been an MCU movie, the big news would be how buff Alexander Skarsgård is. <laughs> now that is a that is a minor conversation that is happening. So I'm not trying to suggest that it's not happening. He's also played Tarzan though, so it's not like I know out of the ordinary for him. I know, but but one of the things I was going to say though is that the, one of the reasons it's not as big of a conversation is because he's not doing it for any other reason than to embody the concept of a berserker. <laughs> right. So it's not meant to be. You're not you're not meant to. There is nobody that is meant to look at at Alexander Skarsgård on screen anytime he's uh, shirtless and think, wow, what a sexy guy. You're, you're never meant to think that. You're meant to think, what a brutal guy. You're meant to think, what an intense guy. You're meant to think, I wouldn't want to run into him and be holding <laughs> an axe of some kind. But you're not necessarily supposed to think like, like, Captain America's ass is, a, you know what I mean? Like you're not, you're not supposed, it's not supposed to go there. The film's not suggesting that you go there. Um, I think the conflict done in this film is fantastic, ever present, even when it's a slow moment, there is still conflict in just about every scene. Um, and it is almost always getting more and more hectic. Um, I'm thinking of the scene where, um, something that we could spend a lot of time talking about, but, uh, the twist scene in this film is when he goes to his mother, Nicole Kidman's character, and he's like, hey, I'm here to save you. And she's like, I don't want to be saved. Your father was an asshole. Um, now you look like you're an asshole. I don't even want to be your mother, basically. And you should actually get in line with what your uncle's doing or get out of here. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and he says, there's no way I'm going to kill my uncle. And she kisses him. Now, why does she do that? Well, from a conflict perspective, think back to your Greek gods. Think back to your Shakespearean um, uh, mental uh, storytelling attributes. She's thinking, if he does kill him, I'd like to be on this guy's side because I don't want him to kill my other son because I love my other son. And so she's literally going full Oedipus with him, I think, in large part, just to get him to say, okay, maybe my mom, even though she said all these mean things about my dad, it, maybe my mom will still get on my side. and. And she's using every attribute of her personality that she knows that she can to get him to think that way, which I thought was really, really interesting. The twists survivor and turns, mode, are, basically, for her. Exactly, it's total survivor mode for her. Um, I think that everyone on this cast and crew understands what Eggers was trying to do and bought into it. Because if you have a few people that go off the rails and are like, I don't feel like doing doing this kind of filmmaking. I don't feel like being out in the rain. I don't feel like doing long takes of things. I don't feel like putting myself in a place that is brutal to make a film. Uh, then this wouldn't work. But it works magnificently and everybody was getting on board with it. And I think everybody has gotten on board with it with his previous films too. Um, even if they even if they had miserable days, they, they knew those miserable days had a purpose. Um, Last thing I'll say, then I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, yeah. And I do want to talk a little bit about vengeance. But last thing I'll say is that um, he says something that I think is incredibly important for storytellers. Uh, he said in an interview, look, the story of the Northmen is very simple. And I think that as a viewer, 
we don't think it is simple per se, but what it did was a simple story allowed him to add depth of elements, depth of character, depth of visuals, because he didn't need to focus on this this really complex story that needed to be unraveled. So he could focus a lot more time on the things that make this a more powerful movie. And so I just wanted to bring that up as like something that I thought was, uh, was really cool because if you take simplicity, you can then add creativity in a way that makes it feel like it's more complex than it maybe it really even is. So any thoughts about what I've brought up? I thought the same thing, like, the plot of this film is a plot. I mean, it's Hamlet. It's the Lion King. Yeah. It's a classic revenge tale. Yeah. Um, if you've seen a story where somebody is out for revenge against whomever. Yeah. It ends how you think it would end. <laughs> it, <laughs> right. It goes along those same story beats normally. I think what's what it, you're right in the sense that like not having to focus on plot allows you to focus on so many of the other elements right. that um, you don't typically think about. And that's not as a filmmaker, that's actually as an audience member. Like there are films that the plot is what's continuously driving the story. Right. Right. And you have to follow the plot, which doesn't give your brain a lot of time to sit in any particular moments. Correct. What is, and this goes back to the idea of like, is this movie really that brutal? It's not. I mean, it has the visuals to make it brutal, sure, but it's not like the most brutal film you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. But every time somebody gets killed or chopped at or whatever the case <laughs> might be, right? it comes with depth from that character. It comes Correct. with... Um, a depth that goes along with what what you know about the hierarchy of living in this time period. You can yes. be a slave, but you all there's a there's a point in this film too where um he they basically go full gladiator, right? They have like this <laughs> right. game set up and they have these two sides where each has slaves on them and yep. they're basically trying to play like an interesting game of like football slash cricket. It's basically Vi Viking Quidditch. <laughs> yeah, it's basically, Vi it's basically Viking yeah. Quidditch. But, like, people are more than willing to, like, die in this game. Right. Or yeah. not willing to die, but willing to murder others to be able to win this game. Yeah. And they're doing it for the fun of the king and queen and, and those people. But yeah. so, anyways, he ends up saving the son of the queen. His, I guess it would be his stepbrother yeah half brother even though yep. even though like it's not explicitly said that way right um but then they say you know oh so thank you for doing this because of that you'll be rewarded but you'll never not be a slave you are a class below you'll always be a class yes. below yes and so they set up this hierarchy uh and because you're on this small island where they've gotten away from all the other people there's only 50 or so people living in this little farm so you begin to understand the hierarchy amongst the farm yeah. without really it ever being said explicitly. Right. And I think that that was a very interesting dynamic. Yeah. Um, especially because you have two different classes of people living on this farm, the slaves and the slavers. Yeah. And then you have the people in charge, the king and queen, and you have probably their like little army of people underneath right. them and so on. But like to watch people die and to watch him, to watch our main character, Amleth, come in yeah, and pick apart people one by yeah. one. He knows who he's going after yeah. and he knows how he's going to kill them. And because of that, it makes it that much more brutal. Yes. Um, because you understand he's not just doing it for himself at that point. He's doing it for the other slaves. Yeah. He's he's making a mockery of the of the people in charge. Right. Um I find that really interesting and fascinating. It to the point in which I I saw this in the same way that like Django Unchained is, right? Like mm. where there is a hierarchy among the slaves and that there's a gray area there to to play right. with. Right. Um 
and it's not fun to talk about. Uh, right. You know, it's not like the most wonderful conversation to have with people to be like, well, yeah, some slaves decided they were better than other slaves or, you know, right. took took opportunities for their own survival. Right. Um, but you get to see that here. And yes. I think that that adds to the depth of the story. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Hey, last last question I have for you, and then we'll um, do a quick reaction to She-Hulk trailer and then, and then uh, close it out. Um, Spider-Man No Way Home was ultimately about vengeance. Yeah. Um, Oh, hey, what's up to Orange Grove 55? Just dropped in and said, I'm at work and can't stay long, but wanted to pop in and send some love. Keep up the great work, fellas. Uh, I was on Orange Grove's, uh, Orange Grove 55's channel talking about JPEG, talking about Disney parks, talking about the return of the red car trolley, and talking about the MCU and Lucasfilm. So go check out their show. I love their show. I, I love listening to their show. It hits a lot of the same points that that I like to talk about um, with my friends like Josh. Um, so go listen to Orange Grove 55 and that whole crew. They're going to come on um, this show to talk about Kenobi in a few weeks. Ooh. So once we schedule that, uh, that'll be really fun to have them on. Um, so definitely shout out to Orange Grove 55 and the whole team over there. Also shout out to um, Nerd Soul and Michael Young because I was on his show a couple times last week as well. I had a, I had a lot of guest spots last week. It was really fun. Got to meet some new people. Uh, had a really great time. So thanks to everyone for having me on their shows. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and speaking of shows, um, hopefully I'll be on an upcoming Dale Wentland show as well with the Disney Culture Club. So quick quick promo in the middle of the show. But now I'm going to really hard segue into Vengeance. Um, Spider-Man No Way Home was about vengeance. This film was about vengeance. The Batman was about vengeance. Um, there's one other film that I'm forgetting off the top of my head that I've seen recently about vengeance that came out. Two questions for you about that. Of the films that you've seen covering Vengeance recently, which one do you think covered it from the best perspective as per Josh Taylor's perspective on Vengeance? And secondly, um, why is Vengeance keep coming up in <laughs> these kind of films as a topic, as a theme in 2022? So it's interesting because when I walked out of the film, I wanted to like send people like Batman memes to be like, I'm vengeance. <laughs> um, because yeah, it is, it is a theme, right? Like the same with like family trauma is a theme right now. Yeah. That's everything. But, um, what, first of all, I'll say what's the best one. Um, yeah. this one's up there for sure. Okay. I would actually, and this is, this is a hot take from me because I yeah. think, I don't think a lot of people like this, but I do. And I think that you don't like this, but I do. Um, <laughs> that the last act of the Batman. Oh yeah. Is good. It's yeah. fine. It's not yeah. great. It's fine. But the idea of replacing vengeance with hope mm. is about like, that was like the message I felt like walking out of the theater. I was like, that's a message for the time for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I know that some people, did not want to hear that. They don't think that the Batman is hopeful uh, or can be hope or whatever the case yeah. might be. Yeah. Um, but I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I, I Going back to what we were talking about earlier, this film rewards vengeance yeah. with heaven. Yeah, right. And I, you know, whether whatever religion you want to say you're in, uh, yeah. I don't believe that vengeance is uh something to be rewarded mm. so mm. i would probably go more with the batman take on this okay one. okay um and why do you think that culture is talking about vengeance so much what what, what is yeah. it about our culture right now that's, that's causing that i think actually interestingly enough we are in the social media age yeah a very negative very vengeful place whether or not we mm. want to say that we are or not i think that i mean you go on any internet forum and there are some people out for vengeance um, <laughs> right on on all kinds of levels yeah and i think that we are just really interested in in what that means in the in the psychology behind where people believe that mm. vengeance is right and 
in this case, it is two things. Um, it is a religious spiritual thing, right? Mm. Where where he believes that he's doing the right act. Correct. And because of that, will be rewarded at the gates of Valhalla. But at the same time, it's also um, an eye for an eye act. Yeah. yeah. And I think that there are people out there who would seek out vengeance for both of those things currently. Right. Right. And um, yeah, it's it's hard. It's and I it's the same idea with this film. Again, going back to the analogy with the Joker, the Joker is not a good person. <laughs> right. Right. You could all agree on that, but his idea is still ve- is still vengeance. Right. It is a society that's failed him. Right. Because of that, he's out for vengeance against that society. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And yes. we want to feel like that we're taking it out without necessarily acting upon it, hopefully. Right. Right. Um, you know, some people do, and that's that's not great. It's the same reason why people play Grand Theft Auto, right? It's like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I I want to like get this frustration about life out, so I'm gonna go steal a Maserati and uh you know yeah do all this crazy stuff in this game right. Uh, I would say that's where we're at. It's a really interesting topic, though. It's a really interesting topic, um, and I think I think you're right on a lot of those things. And there's statistics to back it up. I mean, there's more gun owners now, I think, than there probably have ever been. I mean, um it's it's there's a lot going on in the world right now and the world seems to be angry about it and i think that um as it pertains to that specific question when the world is angry it looks for a villain and vengeance is one of the ways that we can justify our own villainy because we go i deserve it i deserve it i deserve vengeance i've been hurt i've been injured i deserve to have it i'm actually the hero they're the villain, yeah. Exactly. In fact, I had posted a, a reel where I had said that vengeance, these ve- movies are saying that vengeance is wrong. Each one of these movies says vengeance is wrong in its own way, shape, or form. Um, what's interesting to me is that when I posted that, there was even one comment that said, like, no, vengeance, I mean, sometimes vengeance is, is good. What's interesting, I think, when you talk about vengeance, I think that vengeance, if it is an eye for an eye, which is a very old principle that goes back to many spiritual books. When you goes back to an eye for an eye, essentially what you're saying is, is that by the, the equation of how the world could work, justice does equal something bad happened to you. Something bad happened to me. Like we both get the same bad, right? Right. The problem is that most people, when they're thinking about vengeance are only doing the equation they, they are forgetting the toll that vengeance has on the person taking the vengeance. Right. It, you, you, if, you cre- if you turn yourself into a villain, you forget that you just did that. And you think that you're justified and you try to justify yourself. But you have to go full Amleth if you're going to justify yourself in that behavior. Because it's going to be bad for you otherwise. You, you have to deceive yourself that it's okay and reiterate yeah. to yourself that it's okay and make, you, make yourself feel like it's okay. Because otherwise you're going to feel like a total dirtbag. If you um, murder a murderer, yes, you become a murderer. A murderer, <laughs> exactly. And no matter what you try and justify that with, you're a murderer. Exactly. And so some of the hardest teachings, I think, because vengeance probably feels temporarily really good, like, like it does in this film. Um, and I'm going to surprise you with which film I like the best on their take. I'll surprise you in a minute. But I do think that one of the interesting things is like, I, I was reflecting on this as you were talking is that like I, I, I uh, in the in the Bible it says two things one vengeance is God's God will repay and that's fascinating because what it means is in my opinion is that in the universal perspective our lives are not just temporary they are if you if you're an atheist, right? Like the lives are just temporary. There's nothing beyond. There's nothing no kind of afterlife. But if you're not an atheist like me, then you would say, no, no, no. Our lives go on, and so I can get justice even after life is over. Therefore, I don't need to take vengeance on myself because justice will finally occur. It may not occur in my living years. 
it may not be equitable. Like you talked about the slaves and how the slaves have tears. This world is not an equitable place. You don't look right. around and see like, wow, everyone cares about equity. Right? And we're all like, like, this is not that kind of world. We do not live in that kind of space. And so having the belief system that maybe there's more to life, there's maybe more to the universe and, and, and what's beyond the universe, wherein justice will actually occur is, um, I think it can help us take our ego out of the equation and then say, okay, I don't need to get vengeance. I don't need to get revenge because ultimately good will win out, right? Now, that's an esoteric belief because you can't look around yourself and say that and go like, yeah, 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 that's what it is. That's a metaphysical belief for sure. The other, the other comment was by Jesus Christ who said, if somebody hits you and hits you in the face, um, you know, you can't repay it to them. You got to turn the other cheek and ask them if they want to hit you again. And part of that is to suggest that again, your ego is not the most important thing in this situation. Your fellow human beings and how you interact with them and how you relate to them are, are the bigger deal there. And, um, and so my conclusion here is that I like, I like two kinds of movies. My favorite kind of movie is the one that shows us that we cannot attain the thing we desire and be satiated. That's my favorite kind of movie. Very few things in life, like even if you get satisfaction in achieving some of your goals, I think you're still going to be left with some level of emptiness of like, but am I valued as a human and those people don't like me and you have to get your value from somewhere else, right? So I like movies where they end in tragedy and you go like, so I would have preferred, this is why I'm pretty passionate about not seeing the Valkyrie scene because yeah. this is my favorite movie on Ben. This one. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is because if we don't see the Valkyrie scene, it shows you the awful toll of vengeance, the awful toll of believing in the wrong kinds of spiritual beliefs that would lead, that would justify you in those behaviors, right? Yeah. Like, and so I appreciate when someone says something like, like the Batman. So, so if I were to pick a secondary one, I would pick No Way Home because I would say your community needs to be around you so that you don't bring the hammer down on on Green Goblin, right? Or I guess it's Hobgoblin. I'm not sure which one it is. Um, Green Goblin. Uh, but I think that it's hard for me to get behind the Batman because it's ultimately hard for me to get behind. Like, can can a human being just with hope keep getting by in a world that is so violent? I mean, not that we don't need to have hope. I think we do. But like, do I have a hope in Batman? Do I have a hope in Superman? Do I have hope in something bigger than this world? Because I can't believe in this world, man. This world, if I believe in this world, I, I feel so depressed and, dis, and and despairing. So it's hard for me to believe in this world that it's going to accomplish something. So um, I personally prefer to showcase how the world, how awful it is if people get what they want. <laughs> sure. Or that we should rely on our friendships, right? Because you and I don't even believe the same things. But you and I can both reiterate to each other, like, have some hope, Josh. Have some hope, Jay. Like this yeah. is what we 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 got to do. This we're doing this together, even though we're not on the same religious. Um, so okay, so we're we're going way longer than I thought we were going to. By the way, <laughs> um, but let's are you are you cool talking about Northman or you yeah. want to talk about anything else? Yeah, okay, yeah. we're good. I think we covered it in as much detail as anyone has probably ever covered the film so far uh, in the history of podcasting. Um, so thanks for doing that with me. What did you think of this? What did you think of the She Hulk trailer? Um, it's fine. It's, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't give a lot away. I think what it does is it sets a tone and the yeah. tone is much more silly than, mm. um, anything else that's really come before it. I know mm -hmm. like, you know, that there's the guardians of the galaxy and whatever, but this seems like a not an important show and ah. that's not to say like it it is not important in the sense that strong female character etc right. but I, to like everything else that's going on in the marvel cinematic universe right it could um, be like moon knight where it just exists as a season and that's it correct yeah, yeah. is what it kind of feels like and it also feels like because they're bringing like Tim Roth back in and et cetera. It feels like they're maybe like tying up loose ends from the Edward Norton 
Incredible Hulk film. Yeah. That like they just want to like get rid of. Yes. I really wish they would have put Ed Norton in one of the multiverses in Doctor Strange too. That would have been great. It would have been perfect. Anyways. Um yeah, I, I um so two things. I hate reacting to trailers. Why do I hate reacting to trailers? Because they almost never tell you what you're going to get. <laughs> right. And so everyone wants to react to the trailer. Like, let's talk. Whoa, what do you think of the trailer? And I always do because I know people like to talk about it, but I kind of hate it because I love the Hawkeye trailer. We've talked about this before. I love the Hawkeye trailer, but that's not what the Hawkeye gave us. Hawkeye was not MCU diehard, which is what that trailer was, right? Yeah. It's Christmas, MCU diehard. Um, Hawkeye was something else entirely. I liked Hawkeye. Um, I loved the trailer. Um, this trailer, I did not like. However, Jessica Gao, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, was, is the head writer. She is a writer for Silicon Valley, one of my favorite shows of all time. So funny. She's also the head writer or a writer for um, Rick and Morty, which a lot of people love. Yeah. So her depth of comic knowledge is pretty deep. I expect to see this to be a pretty funny show. In fact, telling me that the writer from Silicon Valley is on it makes me pretty intrigued by that because I respect that show a lot. Um, it really understood the startup community because I was a member of that community while that show was going on. And it was like, this is my life. It's so weird. It's like my life, but com comedy. Um, and uh, so I was not impressed by the trailer. Uh, I didn't really like the trailer, if I'm being honest. A lot of people are complaining about the CG, but quite frankly, I didn't even care about that. I just felt like, I know that Professor Hulk is like a thing that has happened in the comics, but to me, making Professor Hulk is like basically saying that the Hulk is the dumbest version of the Hulk that could ever exist. Because like the entire reason the Hulk is interesting to me is that human beings have tempers and those tempers result in damage, damage to other human beings. And that as a premise is phenomenal. I love that premise. That's a great premise. When you say like, no, he gets all the strength, but all the smarts. I'm like, that's a dumb premise. I don't know anybody like that. That's not a thing. Like, I don't get it. Um, so I, I'm just not interested in that part of it. I, I don't know a lot about She-Hulk, the character in the comics. Those who do know about her tend to love her. So I'm looking forward to learning more about her. I'm confident in Jessica Gao, and I can't wait to see where she takes it. But I do not love that trailer, and I'm not going to be one of those people <laughs> that's freaking out saying it's one of the best things I've ever seen. So I mean, uh, here's the thing: it, it yeah. is set up as um, She-Hulk Attorney at Law, right? That's like its correct whole name. If it's a six episode or however long, I'm assuming it's six episodes, like majority of the MCU shows have been. If it's six episodes, where every episode or a majority of the episodes, she is taking on a case against someone that we've known in the MCU. Like, did you ever watch, like, Birdman, Attorney at Law? It was like a... No, I never did. It was like an old cartoon show where, like, uh, you know, Birdman was, like, this attorney, and he would take, like, Huckleberry Hound on. <laughs> you know, awesome. like, it's just really silly. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I think that that kind Bugs of... Bunny, Bugs Bunny got a shotgun charge, uh, right. a non-registered non gun charge. <laughs> yeah, like that kind yeah. Of, for sure, like that kind of thing. Like, <laughs> right. If it's like that in this, but then like, you know, there's um, outside of the courtroom, some other things going on that connect all of the episodes together. Mm -hmm. I'm all for that. Yeah. A courtroom drama, like a silly courtroom drama. Yeah. Could be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that's but what I'm thinking too. Any of that in this no, show. no. In fact, basically, what the trailer says to me is that it's so. Actually, uh, shout out to the John Campia show. He said we were hoping this was going to be like an Ally McBeal series, and it feels like an Ally McBeal series. Um, and it does feel like that from the trailer, but like it's almost more about her. So I really liked how Jessica Jones treated Jessica Jones as a superhero and Jessica Jones as like a human trying to have a life and a dating life. And I thought that handled that really, really, really well. Um, this to me felt like the OC or like, like party of five or like 90210 meets courtroom stupid drama. Cheesy. Yeah. It's just stupid cheesy. And that's the part that I was like, well, if you take Silicon Valley and you say it's that kind of stupid cheesy, then I go hilarious. I'm in. If it's just stupid cheesy with like 
cultural references that are not, uh, how would you say this? A cultural reference for cultural references sake is yeah. not interesting. Like a uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks movie. Exactly. Exactly. Like let's throw in a pit bull song because it just happens to be the thing we do right now. Right. Montage. Um, that I don't like. What I do love is that if you actually get into a character, if you get into a, a, a cultural framework and you start to poke fun at it, but you start to do it from the real issues of the real people involved who are really dealing with these problems. Silicon Valley was so great because I literally could leave a meeting when I was in my startup life. <laughs> I could literally leave a meeting, go watch a Silicon Valley episode and be like, oh my gosh, this literally, literally just happened to me. So it felt super real, right? So tragedy plus time equals comedy. And for a lot of startups that failed, that's tragedy. Now you add time, that's hilarious, right? So I, I kind of hope that it's going to bring that element into uh, into She-Hulk because I think if it's just great reference to Alvin and the Chipmunks, if it's just that, then I'm going to be so disappointed and bummed out. And this trailer is probably, you saying that is probably the best way I could have described this trailer is it just felt like an Alvin and the Chipmunks advertisement and I'm just not into it. <laughs> And they, and like it does have those Ally McBeal qualities that it could yeah. veer further into that. Right. Um, and I don't know. I, I don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. But I mean, I'll watch because. Yeah, like, me too. Me too. Uh, Espe especially yeah. because when I when I get behind a creator and I start to understand even just listening to Robert Eggers talk about the Northman. Right. And, and, and the witch and and the lighthouse, even just hearing him talk about it, I was like. I cannot imagine a person I would want to talk to more on this show about why he's doing these things and what, because, because most times I would rather talk to you than talk to the actual person who did the thing. Right. I don't care if I talk to Hugh Jackman or not. Like I don't invite Hugh Jackman on my show. Right. We had to leap row from, um, from uh, inception on the show, but that's because I knew to leap row actually cares a lot about what goes on in the stories and a lot of actors do don't get me wrong but i this show is not a show for fans to hear hugh jackman talk about how he got ripped this is a show to talk about what do these stories mean to our culture so like the fact that i can listen to robert eggers and be like wow i'd love to talk to this guy because it's really fascinating viewpoint on storytelling i feel like jessica gal is that kind of person likely based on the kind of quality content that she's already put out there. So yeah, I'm, I'm here for that. And I'm and as soon as I get behind a creator, this is my point in saying this, as soon as I get behind a creator, as soon as I get behind a storyteller, I want to hear more from them. I want to see more of their perspectives on the world. I want to know exactly. So I have confidence in those type of things. Like, you know, if it's just, if it's just, you know, a specific actor, I mean, that's fine. But like, I'd rather know who the storytellers are and I have confidence in her. So I'll show up for her basically. Um, all right, Josh Taylor, I want to hear more about um, what you're up to. Mm. Which, what, are your, what are your next few shows about? What are you yeah. doing YouTubes about? And where can people find you? Uh, so you can find me on, on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash modern mouse. I'm currently working on a few videos. Um, one, which will hopefully come out very soon, cross your fingers, uh, is actually about murder mysteries and about um nice uh only murders in the building which i found to be a fascinating show i'm super excited for a second season although i don't know if they necessarily needed it yeah uh i'm also working on a video that's gonna come out right after the new rescue rangers film nice um and then i'm i've been watching a bunch of hayao miyazaki studio ghibli films yeah and i'm trying to work on some content around those movies nice um which is interesting and then on the podcast side of things i am actually diving deep uh, i had a conversation with somebody recently and i found it so fascinating that it's kind of turned into this idea that i'm running with about how we associate things with people um mm. places songs stuff like that. Right. Movies. Yeah. 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 Um, and not the people, you know, like not the people that we know that make the song or do the movie or whatever, but like, right. My, you know, I know my mom's favorite song is this song. So anytime I hear that song, yes. I think about my mom. Yes. Um, but I wanted to talk about it in the sense of, of death mm. and how 
people's deaths can both hurt a place or a song or a movie or whatever that thing is. Yeah. But then that thing can also be a form of healing. Yeah. Um, and, and bring a sense of healing to someone. So um, that'll be the next episode of Modern Mouse, the podcast. That's awesome, man. I can't wait to listen to that. And you're breaking out of the you're breaking out of the Disney mold a little bit there because you're getting into uh, some of those other like only murders in the buildings, not Disney, is it? I mean, it's on it's on Hulu. OK, Hulu OK. It falls under the Disney umbrella, which I mean, I'm very I'm 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 not cheating. Yeah, you're very liberal. Uh, you're very liberal with your yeah, I'm very Disney liberal with the umbrella, the size yeah. of the umbrella. I like that. I like that a lot. Well, thank you for joining me today, Josh. I appreciate it. Um, shout out to Josh. Go follow him. YouTube.com slash Modern Mouse. Look up Modern Mouse on your preferred podcast provider. And Modern Mouse Josh is his handle on Twitter. And you can probably find us making fun Pretty of each other on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> probably so, yeah. <laughs> probably what we're doing. Just sharing, uh, sharing memes to see if we can make each other laugh. Uh, well, if you are interested in my steampunk fantasy Western mashup, that's also a full cast audiobook, please pick up a copy of Death of a Bounty Hunter. Uh, it's about a desperate sheriff who will do anything to save his daughter and a bounty hunter who realizes he can no longer run from the truth. Links are down in the description down below. It is a full cast audiobook, so 11 different voice performers acting out. 14 different characters but that is it for today's show special thanks to josh taylor for joining me today join me live on youtube or facebook every wednesday at 10 a.m pacific standard 1 p.m eastern standard time or eastern time shows will post to the podcast feed later that same day so later the same day the podcast will come out on your preferred podcast feed if you have a topic or a question you'd like me to discuss please leave me a comment or shoot me an email at hi at reclamation society.org I'd love to include your questions in a future show. Also, um, I'll be recording shorter shows throughout the week. I was going to maybe do a shorter show on She-Hulk, but we decided to respond to it here, so I probably won't. But those are the kind of things I might do throughout the week. So just make sure you're subscribed so you get all of the latest content. Subscribe to the Story Geeks YouTube channel or on your preferred podcast provider. That way, you don't miss any of those episodes I just talked about. Thanks for watching, and we will see you on the next show. Thanks again, Josh. See ya. Bye.